It all started on February 7th at the small coffee shop where I worked. We wanted to make things special for Valentine's Day. So me and some co-workers spent our whole shift hanging up pink and red decorations, writing love quotes on the menu board, and doing other romantic things. But as I clocked out and started the short walk back to my apartment, I couldn't shake off a hint of loneliness. I thought about trying Tinder or Bumble to find a date for the occasion. However, deep down, I knew that finding someone I genuinely like within just seven days was almost impossible. So I accepted that I'd be spending Valentine's Day alone again. But when I got home and found a pink envelope in my mailbox, it made me smile a little. It was from a secret admirer just like in those romance books. But when I opened it, all it said was, seven days to go. No sweet message, no kisses or hearts. Just those three words written on the paper. As I looked closer, I realized there was nothing on the envelope or the note to confirm it was meant for me, like my name or my apartment number. So. What if it wasn't meant for me? What if someone sent their Valentine's card to the wrong person? I think I had totally forgotten about it by the next morning when I woke up and went to work again. But when I got home, I was reminded that it wasn't a mistake as I checked my mailbox and found another pink envelope inside. Once more, I have to say I felt pretty excited about it all. There was no mistake with the address or anything like that. Someone must have put all those things in there on purpose. Maybe I truly did have a secret admirer, and Valentine's Day was going to be like a fairy tale. But when I opened the package, I sensed something wasn't quite right. Inside was a small brown teddy bear, but it didn't look new. To be honest, it was filthy. It seemed like it hadn't been washed in years, maybe even decades. The fur was all dirty and tangled, and one of the glass eyes was missing. The note inside the envelope was similar to the last one, but this time it said, six days to go. That's when I realized that whoever was sending these wasn't quite right in the head, and what had been a sort of excitement turned into nervousness. The more I thought about it, the more scared I got. So. I told my friend at work about the whole thing, and they seemed to take it much more seriously than I did. They told me I obviously had a stalker, and that even if this person was doing this out of affection, it crossed a lot of personal boundaries. Suggested I should think about telling the police, but what would I even say to them? That I got a note with no name, no details, and found it in my mailbox? It wasn't the romantic gesture I hoped for, but I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't want to upset someone by calling the police on them. However, when I came home that evening and found something else in my apartment, I felt less hesitant about contacting them. I found what I expected in my mailbox, another note. This time it said, yep, yep, you guessed it five days to go. I went straight to my apartment, grabbed a piece of notebook paper and a marker, and wrote something like, whoever keeps leaving things in my mailbox, please stop. It was nice at first, but now it's getting creepy. If it keeps happening, I'll have to call the police. I taped the note to the front of my apartment building before going to bed, hoping they'd see it and leave me alone. A quick side note. I always take a shower before bed every night, no exceptions, and I'm a bit of a clean freak. My bathroom is always spotless. So, as I finished my shower and was getting ready for bed, something caught my eye. It was something tiny, something that might not grab most people's attention, but to me, stuck out like a sore thumb in my clean white bathroom, 
something caught my eye on the window ledge. A small, shiny dome shape sitting all by itself. I went closer to check it out, but then I freaked out and ran out of the bathroom. I called the police. It turned out to be a tiny glass eye with a bit of fabric attached to the back. I knew right away it was the missing eye from the teddy bear I found in my mailbox. While I was talking to the police on the phone, I figured some things out about the so-called Valentine. Like I said, I take a shower every night before bed. I love hot showers, so I keep the bathroom window open to let out the steam. So, the person who put that glass eye on my bathroom window knew my routine, and they must have watched me for a while to figure out when to put it there so I'd see it. But what really scared me was how they used the teddy bear's eye to send a message, telling me they were watching me. The next day, I replaced the note with one that said, the police have been called, leave me alone. And they did leave me alone after that. However, the whole thing messed with my head for a long time. It was Valentine's Day in 2012. My boyfriend and I live in the south of the UK. We decided to spend the evening at a romantic place at the top of a hill by the coast. The place is called Husp Head. It's really nice there, and sometimes we even stay for weekends with my family. There's a little train ride, and if you go far enough, you can reach the beach. The Husp Head part is on the right side of the beach. It's basically the coastline with a big 200. 100 meter drop off a cliff. The best part wasn't the place itself. It was the view. It was just amazing. We decided to bring some picnic stuff with us as we wanted to have our own little date up there on top of the hill. Even in the evening when it was dark, I was really excited about it because he had never suggested anything like this before. So I thought it was a great idea. We climbed up to Hangersbury Head, which was really tough. The steps were huge, making it hard to reach the top. It seemed like either they built the stairs to help more people and families get up there to enjoy the view, or the stairs were naturally there. It was around 7 p.m., and I thought nobody would be around. When we reached the top, I was correct. There was absolutely no one there. We made it to the top, both of us out of breath, carrying bags full of food and gear. We wore our hiking boots and had our rain jackets just in case it started raining heavily. It was mostly grassy and the path was like a dirt track. You could tell many people had walked there because it's a popular tourist spot. Finally, we found the spots we both liked. We put our bags down on the ground and took out our mats and cushions to sit on. It took a bit of time to lay out the picnic mat, but we managed to set everything up. We had all sorts of food, but I won't go into details. Just think of the kind of food you'd have on a warm summer day at the beach with your family. The only difference was it wasn't warm and it wasn't daytime, but it was summer. I remember the wind started to pick up while we were sitting up there, trying to set up the mat. It made things a lot harder because the mat kept blowing all over the place. Eventually, once we started taking out some food and putting it on the mat, it stopped blowing around. Finally, I could enjoy the incredible view even though it wasn't completely clear with stars shining, the moon was out. And I'd say it was about 80% full. The moon was bright, lighting up all the rocks along the coastline and the sea. It was amazing. About 10 minutes passed, then another 10. Eventually, it felt like we had been there for about half an hour or so. Long story short, the evening was going well. Until then, we hadn't seen anyone, not a single person at the top of this part of Hangersbury Head. I sometimes struggle with anxiety and find it hard to relax. So after about half an hour, 
my boyfriend put out the candles, and we packed them back into the plastic bag in the backpack. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a guy in the distance. I couldn't quite figure out what he was doing, but it looked like he was hiking. He was wearing a black waterproof jacket, similar to the ones we had on. They were wearing boots and some jeans or sweatpants, like you'd call them in America. He walked over and came up to the edge of the cliff. Right away, something felt off, and my boyfriend looked at me with wide eyes, as if he knew what was going to happen next. This guy was actually going to do what I feared. He had his hands on his hips, just gazing out to sea. Eventually, my boyfriend managed to crawl behind him without the guy noticing. My boyfriend was only about three or four feet away, and this guy was still standing there, with his feet right on the edge. Below him was a drop of about 50 to 70 meters, all rocks and stones at the bottom. You see, at the very bottom of this cliff, there were just rocks everywhere. The sea didn't didn't start until another 50 meters from where the cliff ended. So if he fell, he would land on all the rocks. I couldn't bear to watch this, so I looked away. At the same time, I was worried my boyfriend was getting mixed up in this. I knew he was just trying to help, but I was scared he might get hurt too. He was trying to get the guy away from the edge, crawling on top of him. Somehow, he managed to grab the guy by both of his ankles and pull him down to the ground face down. My boyfriend's chest landed almost over the edge of the cliff, and I thought he might break a rib. I heard the guy thud to the ground. He immediately let out a loud yell of pain and started screaming. The guy turned towards us and started swearing angrily. He was using really bad language asking us what we were doing. Even now, the guy says he never intended to do anything. He claims he was just enjoying the view. It was around 7.30 to 8 p.m., and it was completely dark. He was alone. Most people who come to see the views stay on the path. We were off the path, but even then, we were about 50 or maybe 20 meters from the edge of the cliff. This guy went right up to the edge and put his toes over it. And it seemed like half of his foot was hanging off the edge of the cliff. He stood there as if he was about to jump. Even though he didn't press charges against us for assault, he kept insisting that he wasn't planning to jump that evening. Neither me nor my boyfriend believed him. And we never found out what happened to him after that. My friend and I share an apartment. We both have girlfriends. So when Valentine's Day came, we decided to celebrate together with our girlfriends. But it wasn't what you might expect. We just planned to have a movie night or go out for dinner together. My housemate and I were super close. He was basically my best buddy. We've been pals since high school. And even before that, back in kindergarten. So. After all those years of hanging out together, we didn't think it was a big deal to spend Valentine's Day together with our dates. We didn't really mind what our girlfriends thought about it. And since they were friends too, they were probably cool with it anyway. At night, our girlfriends came over to our place. We sat and watched TV for a while, then suddenly decided to go for a walk. We don't know why, we chose to walk to the nearby forest. We thought it would be exciting and make us hungry. So we planned to order food delivery from Uber Eats when we got back home. The forest wasn't too far from our apartments, just a couple of miles away. It wasn't a big forest, and I'm not sure if it was part of a national park. It was really dark when we arrived, and we all drove there together in the same car. But when we got out, we didn't see anything. It was one of those nights when you couldn't see far because it was so misty, foggy, or maybe just really polluted. But we were already there, 
so we decided to go ahead anyway. When we walked onto the main path, it was super quiet. There were roads on both sides of the forest, but they were like rural highways, not busy at all. Since it was late on Valentine's Day, around 10 o'clock, all we could hear was the silence of the forest around us. There wasn't any wind, and the temperature was pretty mild. We had our flashlights on, but they weren't helping much. I suggested that we follow the loop I often ran. I told them I ran this loop once a week, sometimes only twice a month, but I knew it really well. It was like knowing the back of my hand. There were lots of hills, but the path was wide and easy to find, especially with the lights. Even though I'd never done this in the dark before, I felt like I had to be brave now that I was with my girlfriend. I didn't want to show any fear of the dark. It's like this secret belief I have that all guys are scared of the dark in certain situations. If you ask anyone if they're scared of the unknown and they say no, they're probably lying. As we walked down the path, I told them that I run this route every single week. I got a silly idea to leave the main path and try one I'd never been on before. It was really dark and this path was really narrow. It led into one of the pine plantations. The flashlights were no good here. On the main path, we had some light coming through, but on this one, we couldn't see a thing. Also, the path twisted and turned a lot. Sometimes, it even split into different directions. While we walked, my housemate kept talking, and the girls didn't notice anything. They were just relying on me to lead the way. Then, I suddenly realized we were totally lost and needed to go back. We made a mistake and went the wrong way. On our way back, we ended up on an even narrower path further into the forest. We weren't anywhere close to the main path. We were supposed to be on. And now, we were totally lost. Finally, I turned to my roommate and quietly admitted the truth, making sure the girls couldn't hear. I was starting to get really scared because we didn't have bikes or cars, and I figured we didn't have any cell phone signal either. We weren't going to call the police just because we were lost in the forest. So, we spent the next hour looking around, walking down every path to try and find our way back. And eventually, after three long hours, we finally managed to find our way back. The girls never wanted to go on a walk with us again, and I knew it was my fault, even though my housemate pretended he knew the way too, trying to share the blame. I understood it was mostly on me. Eventually, we made it back. When we got back and started eating, we talked about what we would do if we were stuck like that again. His girlfriend suggested the best thing would be to stay where we were until it got light, just huddle together under a tree and wait. It was the early 90s, and I was around 16 or 17 years old. I worked as a babysitter in my neighborhood. My parents said I could only get a car if I saved up for the down payment myself. So, every day after school, I would help kids with their homework or babysit to make some extra money. There was a couple named the Moors who always paid me really well for babysitting. And on Valentine's Day, they asked me to babysit both their six-year-old and 10-year-old so they could have a romantic evening together. They said they'd be back by eight and gave me around 50 bucks just for ordering pizza, renting movies, and doing whatever the kids wanted. So, I asked the kids what they wanted to do, and they both said they wanted to go to the video rental store. I knew Blockbuster wasn't too far, but I told them I couldn't do that until I got permission from their mom. At the time, not everyone had cell phones, so I had to find the restaurant's phone number in a big phone book and call them. It took me about 15 minutes to finally reach her. 
She seemed a bit annoyed that I was calling just to ask about going to Blockbuster. Yeah, that's fine. But don't spend too much of their money, she said. When I told the boys, they got really excited and rushed to grab their jackets. We left before it got dark and got to the rental store in less than 10 minutes. It wasn't busy, just the cashier and maybe one or two other people. I told them, go and pick out whatever you want, as I grabbed some candy bars and popcorn. The older boy came back first with a Disney sequel VHS and asked if it was okay or not. I said yes, but where is your brother? Stairs, slow and deliberate. My heart raced as I tried to think of what to do next. I whispered to the boys to stay hidden and quiet. Then, I grabbed the nearest heavy object I could find, a lamp, and held it tightly, ready to defend us if necessary. The footsteps grew closer, each one echoing through the silent house like a drumbeat of impending danger. Suddenly, the door to the bedroom creaked open slowly, revealing the silhouette of a tall figure standing in the doorway. My grip on the lamp tightened as I braced myself for whatever might happen next. But then, to my immense relief, I heard a familiar voice call out. Hey, it's me. It's just Dad. I let out a shaky breath as I realized it was indeed Mr. Moore's. Returning home unexpectedly early, he quickly assessed the situation and went to investigate outside. It turned out that the man in the long coat was a known troublemaker in the neighborhood, and Mr. Moores had encountered him lurking around before. With Mr. Moores' reassurance and presence, the tension in the air began to dissipate. We waited anxiously as he dealt with the intruder, and eventually returned to assure us that everything was safe. The police were called and they arrived shortly afterward to take the man into custody. As we sat together, shaken but safe, Mr. Moores thanked me profusely for keeping his children safe during such a frightening ordeal. I felt a surge of relief knowing that we had managed to stay calm and handle the situation as best we could. That night, as I finally left the Moores' house and made my way home, couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered in the air, but I also felt a sense of pride, knowing that I had been able to protect the children in my care and help them through a truly terrifying experience. It was a Valentine's Day I would never forget, filled with fear, adrenaline, and ultimately, a deep sense of gratitude for the safety and security of those I loved. I kept my eyes fixed on the intruder, my heart pounding with fear and uncertainty. Mrs. Moores rushed over to us, her expression a mixture of relief and concern as she gathered her children close. I could see the determination in her eyes as she assessed the situation, her focus unwavering despite the chaos unfolding around us. With swift action, Mr. Moores and the authorities managed to apprehend the intruder, bringing an end to the terrifying ordeal. As the police escorted him away, I couldn't help but feel a sense of overwhelming relief wash over me. The nightmare was finally over, and we were safe once again. In the days that followed, the incident weighed heavily on my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling of vulnerability that had consumed me during those harrowing moments. But amidst the fear and uncertainty, there was also a newfound sense of gratitude for the strength and resilience of the Moores family, and for the bond that had formed between us in the face of adversity. As Valentine's Day came to a close, I found myself reflecting on the true meaning of love and sacrifice. It wasn't about grand gestures or extravagant gifts, but
but rather the willingness to stand by those we care about, no matter the cost. And as I looked back on the events of that fateful night, I knew that it was love in its purest form that had guided us through the darkness and into the safety of a new dawn. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on me in the days that followed. Despite the praise from Mr. Moore and my parents, I couldn't shake the lingering fear and unease that had settled in my mind. The thought of what could have happened if Mr. and Mrs. Moore hadn't returned home early haunted me. It was a chilling reminder of the fragility of life and the unpredictability of danger lurking in the shadows. Therapy became a refuge for me, a safe space to unpack the trauma and process the events of that terrifying night. It helped me confront my fears and come to terms with the reality of the situation. Yet, despite the progress I made, there remained a lingering sense of vulnerability a gnawing uncertainty about the identity of the intruder who had threatened our safety. The fact that the police never caught the person responsible only added to the sense of unease. The mystery surrounding their identity left me with unanswered questions and a lingering sense of insecurity. Would they strike again? Would we ever truly be safe? But amidst the fear and uncertainty, there was also a newfound appreciation for the moments of bravery and resilience that had emerged in the face of danger. It was a reminder of the strength that lies within us all, a testament to the power of love and courage to triumph over adversity. As time passed, the wounds began to heal the memory of that fateful Valentine's Day would forever remain etched in my mind. It was a sobering reminder of the fragility of life and the importance of cherishing every moment. For you never know when danger may come knocking at